Members order Minister of Education uh, wishes to make a statement to the House this morning. Minister. Gormiot, can call you. Ladoki, I can call you. But while I'm right, just a yano, you're on Torresk, Fui, Kur, Kon, Kin, and Ejahis Rincha, a Dalsi, Grupa, Kur, Lukoin, and Ira, and Marcha. With your permission, Mr. Speaker, I wish to make a statement on the report of the Ministerial Advisory Group on Advancing Shared Education, which was published in March. In doing so, I wish to set out my response to the recommendations, recommendations and indicate how I intend to move forward. Advancing shared education is one of the most important and sensitive challenges facing civic society. If we are to succeed, there must be a shared readiness to change. Members will recall that advancing shared education is at the heart of the programme for government, and establishing the independent advisory group was a key commitment. I was very pleased when Professor Paul Connolly from the School of Education at Queen's University agreed to chair the group, and his fellow members, Don Purvis and PJ O'Grady, also took up the challenge. I would like to thank them for their work and for producing a very comprehensive, thoughtful and thought-provoking report. I would also like to thank everyone who engaged with the group for their contributions. In debating the report, let us remind ourselves of why sharing is important and what we are trying to achieve. My starting point is the educational case for sharing, to contribute to raising standards, tackling underachievement and creating a better society for all. In planning for the future, we need to address a key question. What sort of schools do we want? We have many different types of schools, each proud of their identity and ethos. I know from my visits how much parents and communities value those schools and how passionately they care about them. So having that choice in our system is a strength. We need now to build on that with confidence that a shared education system is inclusive of all and marginalises no one. But, Mr Speaker, choice can't be at the expense of good education. Our schools need to change, uh, and greater sharing is part of that change. We have too many schools that cannot, by themselves, provide the rich, high-quality education experience that our children need and deserve. To make that change, we must actively plan for shared education. That means we must also move away from planning by competition, schools versus school and sector versus sector in a battle for scarce resources. As Minister, I see far too many development proposals that are written as if the school up the road does not exist. That has to change. We know that parents and children want quality, high-performing schools in their local communities. The parents and communities that I meet are up for sharing. They want choice. But they, aren't, but they are not asking for separation. I believe that the vast majority of parents put quality first. They will, they will choose shared local schools if they provide a quality education. Ta an Enish an, the evidence is there. The Lissanali complex has fired the imagination of the community in Oma and is a game changer in terms of how we plan education. I have seen other good examples of communities in the Moy, in Fermanagh and Ballycastle coming together to look for shared solutions and finding new ways of ensuring access to good local schools. So shared education is not a bolt-on or an optional extra. It is fundamental to delivering good schools and central to my vision that every learner should achieve his or her full potential. Mr Speaker, good education comes first, but equality and good relations add to the case for change. Choice can't be at the expense of good education. Neither can it be at the cost of separation by religious belief, socio-economic status or educational needs. Such separation is bad for children and bad for society. Separation is damaging, unnecessary and avoidable, and society has the power to change it if the will is there. In higher and further education, sharing and integration is already the norm. Why should schools be any different? We have sharing in preschool education and youth services. We have integrated schools naturally shared schools, and many other examples of good practice in schools working together. But we can and we must do more. Sharing must become the accepted reality at every stage of education, from early years to postgraduate study. There is also a persuasive equality case. We have good schools serving children of every religious faith and none. Today, no child is denied a good education because of their religion. However, the same cannot be said for socioeconomic status. We know that children living in lower income brackets are, are at a much higher risk of educational underachievement. 
Members are familiar with the standard measure. Our aim is that every child should leave school with at least five good GCSEs, including English and maths. Today, only 34 per cent of children entitled to free school meals achieve that. For other children, the figure is 68 per cent. So a child from a lower income bracket is at double the risk of underachievement. That is unacceptable and we must change it. We also know that academic selection is a barrier to children in free school meals and from lower income families. Just over 7 per cent of children in grammar schools are entitled to free school meals. For other post-primary schools, the figure is 28 per cent. So poorer children are more likely to be rejected by a grammar school. Is that what those schools want? Only they can answer that question. But segregation by parental income is a reality that we cannot ignore. Members know my views on academic selection, and I will say more of that in a few moments when I turn to the recommendations contained within the report. But whatever happens in relation to selection, we need greater sharing across the socio-economic divide. Can call you, I'm sometimes accused of having an anti-grammar agenda. Well, let me put on the record once again. I do not. I have an anti-academic selection agenda. But I offer this challenge to grammar schools. Educate the whole community, not just a part of it. Across the world, the best performing education systems combine excellence with equality of outcomes. In other words, almost all their pupils achieve high standards, not just a few. That must surely be our goal too. Bringing all of that together, it's clear that sharing brings educational benefits. Sharing builds respects for diversity and good relations. Sharing builds equality. And sharing builds a confident community. So my vision is one of education without barriers. Good schools where children learn, grow and develop together. Schools where sharing is the accepted normality. Shared education can and should uh, involve in every type of school. It's about developing local solutions to, the needs, uh, to local needs, not one size fits all. It's a challenge to all, but a threat to none. Every school can share, and I challenge every school to ask itself, what more can we do? Before turning to the recommendations within the report, I want to talk about the relationship between shared education and the integrated sector. Let me make it clear. They are different routes to the same objective. The right model is the model that enjoys the support of the local community. Integrated education will continue to play an important role, and my department, in line with its statutory duty, will continue to encourage and facilitate it. Shared education should also be encouraged and facilitated, and communities should be encouraged to choose the model that suits them best. This is in line with the current approach to integrated education, where the transformation process begins with consultation with the local community and a parental ballot before the submission of a development proposal to the department. Every community should be on a journey to sharing. Different routes will be chosen, and some will get there sooner than others. When a community takes a step, however modest, we should encourage and support them, and yes, perhaps challenge them to go further, but in a positive manner. Let me now turn to the recommendations contained within the report. The report contains 20 recommendations in five groups. I welcome all of the recommendations. There are some that I accept fully and will aim to take forward as soon as possible. There are others that I accept in principle, but there may be a better way forward than what the group recommended. A third group needs further consideration and debate here in this assembly and across our society. The recommendations begin with mainstreaming, which is the right starting point. We need to ensure that sharing is in the DNA of our education system, in legislation, policy and the structure of ESA. I want to be in a position to bring the Education Bill back to the Executive and the Assembly in the coming weeks. However, I cannot do that on my own. In bringing the Bill back, I propose to include a statutory definition of shared education and provisions for ESA to encourage and facilitate it. These will complement the provisions on integrated and Irish medium education and will not reduce or dilute them in any way. I will also require ESA to reflect sharing in its structure, in its corporate plans and its strategies, and I will hold them to account for it. The report also recommended the inclusion of a shared education premium in the, funding, in the common funding scheme. I accept this in principle, but further consideration is needed before we move to implementation. However, I acknowledge that if shared education is to grow and develop, 
then we will need to mainstream financial support for any additional costs involved. Shared education is very much at the heart of the Together Building a United Community programme. In addition to those programmes, my department is working with Atlantic Philanthropies and OFM DFM with a view to put in place an additional funding programme to support shared education. As we move ahead, I will look carefully at the evidence so as to ensure whatever financial support we provide is targeted at what works best. I also need to see what additional resources my executive colleagues will make available for mainstreaming. The, the second group of recommendations deal with supporting schools, ensuring that sharing delivers real educational benefits, and recognising and promoting the spread of good practice. I welcome these recommendations also. I have asked the Chief Inspector to consider how best to take them forward in the inspection process and the inspection cycle and report back to me. We ask a great deal of our teachers and it is right that we equip and support them to deliver. That is why ESA will have a statutory duty to ensure support for teachers in schools and governors. I also welcome the recommendations in supporting and delivering developing teachers. These will be fed into the revised teacher professional development strategy, which is already under development. I will ensure that includes an examination of how best to equip and support teachers to deliver shared education. The third group of recommendations, numbers 9 to 14, focus on what schools need to do in relation to engagement with parents, the delivery of the curriculum and the rights of children and young people to participate in the decisions that affect them. I welcome these recommendations. As I said earlier, supporting schools will be key to part of ACE's role, and this will include supporting schools to communicate with parents. Recommendation 10 calls for a review of the delivery of key aspects of the curriculum. I accept this recommendation in principle and welcome the emphasis on promoting equality. However, taking this forward requires careful thought, and any review of the curriculum or its delivery, our aim must be to support teachers to adopt best practice. Therefore, as a first step, I have asked the Chief Inspector to carry out a survey of current practice with a particular focus on what additional support and development teachers need. The report draws attention to the right of young people to participate and be heard in relation to decisions that affect their lives. I support this, and my aim is that every school will have an effective method of encouraging young people's participation in the life of the school. My department will continue to encourage schools to implement uh, the Democra School Programme and to take the advice, support and guidance pack available from the Commissioner for Children and Young People. However, I believe that effective participation of young people is likely to be achieved more effectively if the approach is decided by the schools themselves rather than being imposed from the outside. Therefore, I prefer not to go down the compulsory route at this time. However, I will keep this under review and if sufficient progress is not being made, then I will consider the case for stronger action. The report also recommended that schools should be subject to the statutory equality and good relations duties in section 75. I strongly support the intention behind that recommendation. Every school must play its part in promoting equality of opportunity and good relations. Every school must tackle discrimination and bullying, whether it stems from religion, sexual orientation, or any other aspect of a young person's identity. Members will be aware that this is a cross-cutting matter, as equality legislation is the responsibility of OFM, DFM. I want to discuss recommendations 12 and 13 of the report with my executive colleagues and consider how best to give effect to them. Using section, 75, using section 75, which sets out minimum requirements, may be one option. However, there is nothing to stop us from enhancing our equality duties so as to ensure better policy making. Another way may be to adopt the approach used in England, where schools have to set clear objectives for promoting equality and are held to account for their delivery. Whichever option we choose, I want the emphasis to be on action, not on bureaucracy. Recommendation 14 deals with special education. It calls for the development of effective models of collaboration between mainstream, special schools and educational support centres. One of my priorities as Minister has been the building of an inclusive educational culture, both within and between our schools. Therefore, I strongly support this recommendation. However, it would be wrong not to acknowledge the work already being undertaken in this area. The current special educational needs framework already promotes inclusion, ensuring wherever possible that children and young people are taught in mainstream schools. 
This will remain a fundamental tenet of the work being taken forward as part of the SEIN and inclusion review. <coughs> that being said, where a child's best interests are served by the attendance at a special school, that option will of course remain open. In terms of the collaboration across sectors, special schools are full and active members of the area learning communities. This is essential to provide opportunities for pupils to learn and grow alongside their peers in special and mainstream schools. Going forward, I will ensure that shared education projects and shared education campuses will include special schools where that demand exists. Arvalee Special School will be taken forward as part of the Listen East Shared Education Campus with the construction of the new Arvalee uh, School and Resource Centre commencing next year. The fourth set of recommendations deal with area planning, 15 to 17, which will be central to the delivery of shared education. Concordia, I will make it a priority for my department to bring forward guidance on a range of sharing options that school and communities may wish to explore, clear practical advice on how to bring forward a development proposal for sharing, and guidelines on the development of area plans to ensure that edu shared education is encouraged. Recommendation 16 calls on my department to meet parental demand for different types of schools. I accept that recommendation in principle with one important caveat. Any proposal for a new school must be sustainable and capable of delivering high quality education for the pupils it serves. Let me say clearly what I want to see. I want to see collaboration, not competition, sharing, not duplication. Recommendation 17 calls for it to be made easier for a school to transform its ethos from one type to another. I am pleased to say that the Education Bill already provides for this. Every school will be able to decide its own ethos and set down a schemes of management and employment scheme. Any school will be able to change its ethos at any time simply by bringing forward new schemes. There will be no need for any complex or bureaucratic legal procedure. Finally, let me turn to the recommendations on academic selection 18 to 20. It will surprise no one when I say that I welcome and strongly endorse them. Some people have criticised the group for including these recommendations. They claim they are nothing to do with sharing. Those people are missing a very important point. Sharing means education without barriers, without segregation. The group's advice is very clear. Selection discriminates. Selection divides. Selection is a barrier to children from low-income families. Those who ignore the evidence should ask themselves. If segregation by religion is wrong, how can segregation by income be right? I look forward to the day when this Assembly decides to end academic selection for good. Until that day, I will strive to make it irrelevant and to limit the damage that it does. I will continue to promote all ability schools where academic and vocational learning is the norm, and these will be taken forward through the area planning as recommended by the advisory group. In conclusion, can call you. The report asks us all to think differently about delivery of education. It reminds us that sharing begins with respect for diversity and the right to equality. It asks us to put the needs of young people ahead of interests of institutions. It challenges long-held assumptions about what is possible. Through sharing, we all benefit and no one loses. Sharing means celebrating diversity, not undermining or hiding it. Educational ethos like language and culture should be used to build bridges, not barriers. Mr. Speaker, our education system should be enriched by diversity, but not blighted by separation. Mullum and Turisk, Shahig and Chunnel. I commend the report to the Assembly. Mr. Mayor. Mervyn Storey, Chair of the Education Committee. Mr. Storey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I first of all apologise to the Minister and the House for not being able to stay for the remainder of the debate because, uh, unfortunately, I have uh, uh, something to attend which I have promised that I would do. However, Mr Speaker, in coming to the House and listening to the Minister and reading the, uh, report that, uh, the statement that he has made, it is extremely disappointing that, yet again, the Minister has lit the litmus paper to create more contention and more controversy around an issue whereby there should not be controversy. And at a time when the Minister is under ex extensive pressure 
in relation to the common fund and formula. I think that he would have been better spending his time in Rathgale addressing that problem rather than putting another problem and other problems on the table today. However, uh, Mr Speaker, can I, on behalf of the committee, uh, say that recognising the growth of popular and sharing among schools is indeed something which we should uh, celebrate in terms of the, the, the schools that have been successful in relation to that issue. Indeed, in my own constituency, and reference has been made to the work that goes on uh, in places such as Ballycastle. But the committee took evidence from the Ministerial Advisory Group in May and decided to undertake an inquiry later in the session on shared and integrated education. And it seems, Mr Speaker, that whenever the Education Committee announces an inquiry or considers a plenary debate, action appears uh, to, uh, uh, from the Department in regards to that issue. So I am glad in one respect that the Education Minister seems to be taking it, uh, and paying attention to what is going on in the Committee. Mr Speaker, the Minister appeared to indicate his support for Recommendation 17 which suggested that a transformation process be put in place which will allow schools to adopt an alternative ethos. In his statement, the Minister also referred to the existing development proposal process for transformation to integrated status. Can I ask the Minister if it is his intention that the implementation of Recommendation 17 will replace the current development, uh, development process? And can I ask if he is therefore able to alter the process by which popular oversubscribes will be allowed to expand as, recommend, as recommended in the report? And can I ask the Minister if the terms of reference of the reported ongoing review of the development proposal uh, process include all of this and if he has noted the legislative proposals in Scotland which are indeed to take the Minister completely out of these contentious the member, development proposal decisions. Uh, quite lengthy contribution. I'm not sure what the controversial part was because the member never got to that. But in relation to pressure, or, or order, order, allow the minister to answer. Order. In relation order. to pressure, pressure goes with the job. It's how you deal with the pressure, which is the important thing. And I can assure you order. Order. that, uh, as has been recently evidenced in the media when I challenged political parties to come up with alternatives to my proposals, they are left fumbling somewhat uh, to come up with those alternatives. So you, you have another three days to come forward with alternatives to my proposals around the common funding formula, and I wish you well. Order. 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 Uh, order. 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 Uh, the Minister the floor. Order. Order. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in relation to the member's response to the shared education report, I'm not sure what the member's position is on the shared education report because I have yet to hear a formal response from the member or his party in relation to the shared education report. I think the shared education report is very thought-provoking and it challenges us all. There's challenges contained with that report to all parties around this chamber. And I think it deserves to be studied closely. I think it deserves to be given the respect that it is due. And I think that it should form, form, as I have said in my response to uh, the report, form an integral part of our education system moving forward. But when it's OK standing up in Castlereagh and making a statement about shared education, or it's OK in making commitments in a programme for government about shared education, but if you're serious about shared education, it's much more than a green and orange issue. Because there's rift lines running through this society not only in relation to orange and green, but there's also rift lines running through this society by those who have and those who have a whole lot less. And unless we deal with that, then we're going to leave a large section of this society behind, and that's going to be the detriment to this entire society. So the Shared Education, the, the Ministry of Education Group took that on board, and they brought that challenge to this assembly and to all involved, and I think we have to answer that challenge and deal with it. In relation to taking ministers out of decisions and taking ministers out of this and taking ministers out of that. I was a, got involved in politics to make decisions. I was elected by the people, as everyone in this House was, to make decisions. And you see when those decisions get difficult, you don't opt out of those decisions. You make a decision on the basis of evidence and you believe it's the right decision and you stand 
diet. That's what politics is about. That's what leadership is about. That's what being in a minister's post is about. So I know I will not be accepting any proposals to take a minister out of decision-making roles. That's democracy. That's democracy at play. And I won't be accepting any dilution of democracy in that role. In relation to Recommendation 17, I've already said that uh, I, I accept Recommendation 17, that within the Education Bill, which is gathering dust somewhere, that Recommendation 17 is dealt with. So if we want to deal with it, bring the Education Bill forward and we'll deal with it. Order, order, order. That's not a good for the Chamber. Order. The Chair of the Education Committee has had quite a bit of latitude this morning as all chairs of committees would normally have when it comes to ministerial statements. But from here on in, let's have a question for the statement. And I call Chris Hazard. Can I thank the Minister for indeed bringing forward the statement today and indeed echo the comments of the Minister and thanking Paul Connolly, Don Purvis and PJ Grady um, for their work. Indeed, I think it's commendable that the group have not only included but put socio-economic integration at the very heart of what shared education means. You know, very often our media and you know, those maybe disengaged from the debate have been consumed by a false ethnic debate of what shared versus integrated education is. Member, come to this question. No, not a problem. Indeed, the fundamental driver of raising education attainment is undoubtedly the importance of socio-economic integration in our schools. Will the Minister ensure that, as he advances with shared education, that all barriers in our system, be they ethnic or economic, will be removed? Gorham uh, Thank the Member for his question. Um, as, as I posed in my statement, if members believe that segregation by religion is wrong, why, how can they believe that segregation by income is right? That's the challenge for this Assembly. And facts and figures may get in the, in the way of, of a good argument, but no one has been able to challenge the facts and figures that I have produced in relation to educational underachievement and the detrimental impact that is having on those families from lower income backgrounds. So if we are serious and the programme for government sets us a target, not only in relation to education, shared education, improving education, it sets a specific target and it's opening paragraphs to tackle uh, social deprivation. It also sets me challenges around social deprivation as well. So the, group, the, the ministerial advisory group has come forward with a report, a well-researched report, a well-informed report about sharing education in its totality. So those who are serious about sharing education need to study this report. They need to look at it in detail, and if they disagree with its findings, they need to come back with an evidence-based retort uh, uh, response to those findings, instead of what we're hearing since the report has been challenged and what we've heard in the chamber this morning. Dominic Bradley, Mr. Bradley. Gormila Mayogut, Akhan Kholya, Akuskoom Boyekhasleshin, Ara Asokt Ragra. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I thank the, the minister for uh, his statement. Um, Tirach Boilam Kesh the Kurrer, Anantian Shell Lom Gowil Sar, Upper Janta Eg Nakosti, Folam a Cantor, August Gajevin, Eg Chunskal, Realtus, Olskal Narina, August Aravijalish Ara and May Nis Mo Arigid or File, No Kadid Gajirk Nahakmani Brescia, a Vesser File, Larinch and Educus Akaho. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that the uh, area learning communities have uh, laid down the foundation for uh, shared education and should be congratulated, uh, as is the case with the shared education project at Queen's University. But could the Minister tell me uh, or give us more detail uh, on the financial package which will be available uh, in the future to advance shared education? Uh, thank the member for his question. Uh, we are currently in discussions with American Philanthropies along with OFM DFM about a significant amount of money being invested in shared education programmes. I don't want to go into any more detail than that because the discussions are at an advanced stage and all, all partners to those discussions are working to a successful conclusion in regards to those. In relation to mainstreaming funding going into the future. The common funding formula, as we know, is currently under review, but the common funding formula can be reviewed on an annual basis. And I think what we need to do, firstly, is move forward the definition of shared education, as proposed in the ESA bill. So, therefore, we will have a legislative basis upon which to judge 
projects which schools and communities are bringing forward for shared education and build the criteria from that and therefore we will be able to fund that. So my focus at the moment is in terms of funding, continue those discussions with OFM, DFM, American Philanthropies, uh, get a legislative designation of shared education and then move forward to including that in a future common funding formula review. Joan Dobson. Mrs. Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I welcome the statement and most of what has been included in it. But unfortunately, the Minister has reverted to type in relation to academic selection, an issue which seriously undermines, I feel, this report and likewise the otherwise positive statement. Can the Minister explain how the state how in the statement he accepts recommendation 16 in principle to meet parental demand, but then on the next page states that he will strive to make selection irrelevant. And what about Minister Area Planning uh, Parental Demand in Craigavon, which shows overwhelming support for the Dixon Plan? Um, thank the member for her question. In relation to her welcoming the majority of the report and then dismissing the rest of the report, during her contribution, she didn't give me evidence as to why she would dismiss. I assume she's talking about the last three uh, recommendations. Where is your evidence to dismiss them? Where is your evidence to dismiss the evidence and the reports contained, not only within this report, but numerous other reports, both local and international? Where is your evidence to dismiss the findings of the United Nations Council on the Rights of the Child? So the member can stand up and say she dismisses something, which she's perfectly entitled to do, but I think in a political debating chamber, there is an onus upon you to stand up and prevent, present the evidence as to why you dismiss it. Uh, in relation to parental choice, the report does refer to parental choice, but it refers to it in the context of all children having that choice, all parents having that choice. The system which the member appears to be wedded to does not present choice for all, does not present equality for all, and the evidence shows that time and time again. I welcomed, I have to say, your, your leaders contribution to the education debate on Saturday um, in relation to how the 11 plus was a blunt instrument uh, on, on moving forward. I, he, he quoted a quote which I have used often myself. It asked the question, are you clever instead of how are you clever? But my, my uh, response to that would be that the role of a school, of all schools, is to develop that in every child. It should not be a barrier to a child getting into a school. But I welcome uh, Mr. Nesbitt's contribution to that debate, and I think we need to expand on that debate. Trevor Lund. Mr. Lund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I largely welcome this statement and the report. Uh, it, it's very refreshing to see a report on shared education which fully acknowledges the position of integrated education on the same page. Uh, could I ask the Minister, in, in line with Recommendation 16 around parental demand and in line with the theme running through the report about parental demand and ease of transformation and so on, can it, can it give us an assurance that in, in the future, if integrated schools want to expand, I'm not just talking about new ones, but if integrated schools want to expand due to parental demand, that he, he will see to it that they are given every opportunity to do so? Um, the, the current method for uh, schools expanding is through the development process. Now, I have committed to reviewing that development process, but in relation to the member's question around integrated schools, we also have a statutory obligation to um, facilitate and promote integrated education, which is something my department takes very seriously. And I can assure you that any proposal coming forward from an integrated school will be read through uh, those policies, that we have a responsibility to allow them to expand and to meet parental demand in relation to integrated education. Mr. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I note um, Recommendation 3 talks about uh, the inclusion of a shared education premium in the common funding formula, and you're talking about there that you're going to carefully consider that. Would the Minister not also consider a carefully a targeted premium? to schools which are underachieving, because I would assume that the Minister's real target in all of this is actually to improve achievement within our schools, no matter what sector they come from. Well, I have included one in the current funding formula uh, review, and I have been ambassador by the Members' Party for doing so. Um, but I am not going to fund schools simply because they are underachieving. I, I will want to know that if any further funding going to schools, that, that funding is going to be used to raise educational attainment. It is part of a programme of 
raising educational attainment I haven't been developing and my predecessor has been developing over this last number of years, closely aligned to every school, a good school, uh, to ensuring that there is community involvement in our schools, that we uh, also encourage communities and parents to become involved in education and to take ownership of education. So uh, I wouldn't argue for one moment that more funding is the answer on its own uh, to raising standards, but it is part of a programme on po of policies which will raise standards and, and is required. Uh, I have answered in terms of my, my deliberations around the premium going forward, but I, 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 I am, I've strongly argued that if we are going to raise educational attainment, particularly among socially deprived communities, we need to resource that as well, but those resources need to be carefully monitored and there needs to be outcomes from those resources. Phil Flanagan, Mr Flanagan. The, uh, the Minister's statement rightly welcomes the good work of the Independent Advisory Group on Shared Education. I would like to put on record my thanks to organisations like the Fermanagh Trust, funded through Atlantic Philanthropies, who have very much been leading the debate on shared education across relig religious and social divides. Um, and the Minister has highlighted those. But would he agree with me that sharing across the border, um, which has been trialled by the Fermanagh Trust, um, is also an avenue that we need to go down in? And that, that where it's in everyone's best interests, um, that it should also form part of any plan to deal with the future of shared education. Uh, can I also place on record my uh, appreciation uh, to all those organisations that have been involved in shared education programmes down through the years? You mentioned, and, well, I'll not mention any because you mentioned a few, you may leave someone out in the end. You may cause offence uh, unwarranted. So I congratulate all those groups that have been involved in this and, and all those funders that have been involved. Shared education is not a new idea. Uh, dates back decades, um, and indeed dates back even before partition, in relation to the need for greater collaboration and sharing between the different educational uh, sectors we have on this island. We have to uh, mainstream it, we have to resource it, and we have to drive it forward. There has to be the political will to do that. I can confirm to the House that I have the political will to do it. it um, the House and the Executive needs to back that up as well uh, to move it forward. As with any policy, there may be different points of views on different parts of it, uh, but the main ethos and the main uh, policy I think all members of the House uh, can get behind. In relation to sharing across the border, of course it is part of shared education. Um, the, the, the border uh, in many communities uh, along that border has had a detrimental effect to their socio-economic well-being, uh, and I think if we can overcome that in educational terms, then I am happy to support that. Sammy Wilson. Mr. Wilson. I assume that the statement this morning was written by the Minister and not by any civil servant. I do not think anyone put their, their signature to such a, an, an ill-thought-out uh, statement. But can I just ask one question? And this is a fundamental question, especially since funding, planning and even the existence of schools in the future will depend upon whether or not they are regarded as shared schools. The Minister has indicated in the statement that he believes division can occur on the basis of religion income, ability, sexual orientation, disability and ethnicity. Is he, going, is he saying that he is now going to expect every school in Northern Ireland to have a quota of people who fall into those categories, or is this simply rhetoric that schools can continue to do whatever they want and admit whoever they want? Because there is only one, two, one of two ways. Either you have a measurable, there is a way of measuring shared education, or else this is a meaningless document. If it is uh, 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 the, the former, then will the Minister tell us, is he about to introduce for shared education a quota on the basis of the divisions which he has outlined Member in the finish. statement? Member must finish. Um, it appears that civil servants wrote the member's statements when he was a minister, which is up to him. Uh, I, I would not read out a statement unless I was comfortable with it. Um, I suspect there has been a number of statements the members read out which he has been comfortable with. Mm -hmm. After his question, I am not sure. Do you want me to introduce a quota yeah. or do you not want me to introduce a quota? Because I am confused after you have asked me the question. Because you seem to be condemning the quota idea and then you seem to be condemning the idea that there is no quota. The member needs to read the statement in its totality and he needs to go back and he needs to read the report. The definition of shared education is driven by communities. We are, are moving towards that. What we are saying to communities is this is our definition of shared education. If communities can come together, if schools can come together, and they fit into this definition of shared education, and it may be two out of three, it may be three out of four, four out of five, it may be, but I am not suggesting that we introduce a quota. 
And why would I suggest that? Because this has to be driven by the communities involved in shared education. We have to have a measure against which we can measure schools' contribution to that shared education debate. We have a definition. I bring forward further guidance in relation to that, and we will bring further guidance forward when we mainstream funding towards that. But when the member makes up his mind as to whether he wants me to introduce a quota or not introduce a quota, he can come back to me. Uh, Joe Byrne. Mr. Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, given that the Minister has very much outlined the merits of shared education, which I think I regarded as a good concept in theory, and the Listen Alley project in Oma has largely been welcomed by the local uh, learning community. What time scale does the Minister envisage for getting some practical work done and trying to implement the shared education strategy? Because timelines and money are going to be crucial going forward. Um, shared education is rolling out as we speak. I would like to see uh, a legal definition being put in place through the ESA bill. But, however, if ESA is, continues to be delayed, then I will consider bringing forward uh, legislation to introduce a definition of shared education separately from the ESA bill. I, I, I place such importance upon it. Um, let's use this analogy as an example. Demolition work starts in this analogy this week. That, that's a, a firm sign, uh, in one sense, that construction is going to take place, that work's beginning. We're clearing the site. Uh, construction on the Arvalee School will, will commence uh, in 2015, or uh, thereabouts. So there is money being pumped in towards it. We are in advanced discussions with OFM, DFM and American Philanthropies about bringing forward funding uh, for shared education. Um, so all, all, there's a rolling programme of work going on as we speak about shared education. Ian McCarthy. Mr McCarthy. Mr Speaker, thank you very much indeed and I welcome the Minister's statement this morning. Uh, would the Minister agree with me that our grammar schools must be uh, encouraged to participate fully in the sharing agenda to the benefit of our entire community? Uh, without doubt. Um, no school should be allowed to stand on its own uh, to the expense of either schools around it or to the broader community it serves. Uh, the figures in relation to socio-economic sharing are stark. The average for grammar schools for free school meals entitlement is 7 per cent. average for post-primary schools is 28 per cent. Now, no one has yet challenged those figures or suggested those figures are wrong in any way. So that's a challenge for the grammar schools. If grammar schools uh, want to educate the entire community, they need to take action to educate the entire community. John McAllister. Mr McAllister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I welcome the Minister's statement. I think actually his, his, uh, his outlined division on shared education I think, is much more realistic than comments others have, have made. The Minister uh, does put a heavy emphasis on the Education Skills Authority. Uh, without stating the obvious, how long can he run that on in shadow form and continue to fund that. When is he going to bring the legislation back and how does he hope to get it through this House? Well, I, I have uh, a position paper which I believe is a significant compromise on my behalf. It allows others to, uh, in my opinion, to offer goodwill to the Education Bill, but that's a matter for them. I cannot bring the Education Bill back to this House unless the Executive approve it. To do that, I need to get the Education Bill on the Executive agenda. That has not been achieved. Uh, it cannot go on forever. Um, I think both myself and uh, the executive need to make up its mind whether they want to deliver that program for government commitment or they don't. Uh, and that, that day is coming to us realisation. I, I suspect now we're not going to meet the program for government commitment to have ESA established in 2013. Like this is the last number of weeks in October. I have a programme for government commitment signed up to by all the executive parties to have it established by 2013. I suspect that is now missed. Now, if it's missed, the executive will have to make up its mind. Do they want to continue with it or do they want to set it aside? But it is coming to make up your mind, eh? hey, Jim Allister. Mr. Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's quite clear to me that the Minister knows that he's lost the argument on academic selection, hence his desperation to distort the issue by suggesting that it's a question of segregation by income. Could I ask the Minister, of the thousands of children who in the coming weeks will sit selection tests, how many questions will there be asking them about the income of their parents? Isn't it quite clear the testing is about aptitude and ability? And why is the Minister trying to distort the issue, the issue into pretending 
that it's selection by income when it's nothing of the sort? Um, the, the member has a reputation for a, a mind which interrogates subjects. Why he chooses to turn off his mind when it comes to academic selection is beyond me. Because all the evidence, and the member is a barrister, and he works with evidence, and he presents evidence, all the evidence shows that academic selection has everything to do with income and absolutely nothing to do with educational ability. All shows it. As soon as a child from a lower income background walks into the assembly hall, sits down in front of the unproven, unregulated test, they are being economically tested. And the evidence shows that by the outcomes from those tests, it shows by the very fact that the average uh, for grammar schools for free school meals is 7 per cent, opposed to 28 per cent across society. International evidence shows us that children from lower econo uh, economic backgrounds are at greater disadvantage in education than any other sector. So when the member is standing in Twadell Avenue, and he's standing in Portadown Sound Centre, and he's standing in other roads, telling the Protestant working class that he's looking after them, you're not kidding anybody, because you are leaving those people behind time and time again, every time you use a false argument that academic selection does not disenfranchise anyone. Stephen Mitry. Mr Mitry. Uh, the Minister states he will continue to promote all ability schools where academic and vocational learning is the norm and these will be taken forward through area planning. Can he inform the House if such all ability schools are rejected by the overwhelming majority of people? Will he endeavour to enforce this on a community, and I think particularly of my community in the Dixon Clan area. Um, there's another one defending the Protestant working class. Uh, you're, not, you're, not, you're not interested in the Dixon Clan. You're interested in two schools out of the Dixon Clan yep. Portadown College and Lurgan College. Order. Order. The, only, order. the only two schools you are interested in in the Dixon Clan, that's the two of them. So let's, let's dispel this myth that you're defending the Dixon Clan because you're not. And it just happens to be also the schools which one of your major funders is also interested in. Order, as that's well. a remark to the chair. So order, but in order, relation... order, or, order, order. Allow the minister to, 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 to speak. Order, but minister must be heard. Order, and let's have all remarks to the chair. Order, through the chair. The member knows fine well who his supporters are, and the member knows fine well who is backing up the, the, some of the false arguments I have to say, and disgraceful arguments, which are currently being presented. In the, in the media. Mr. Speaker, is it in order for the Minister? Oh, oh, order, oh, order, order. Uh, allow the Minister to conclude. Order, order. Um, the member is opposed to all ability schools. What is his opposition to all ability schools? Surely the purpose of education is to allow all people of all abilities to flourish and enriching themselves. Order. Order. Yes. Order. No. One size does not fit all, the member responds. It is a pity that the, 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 the leading economies in the world, that the leading education systems in the world, all disagree with them. Because it is proven, not by Sinn Féin research, not by Department of Education research, but by international research, that those schools that have an all ability mix flourish that those young people in them who are academically gifted actually do better in an all-ability school than they would closet it away in a school which claims uh, to, be, to be academically superior. So all that evidence suggests that you have actually got it wrong. But the argument doesn't suit you. It doesn't suit your party supporters. And when I mean by party supporters, I mean by your funders. And it order, doesn't, order, and it doesn't order, support, order, order, order. And it doesn't support order. the narrow agenda which you are driving forward. That's the problem. Not the facts, not the evidence, not the support material, not the research. It doesn't suit your narrow agenda. Chris Little. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I welcome the Minister's statement today as well and recognise the work of the Ministerial Advisory Group and indeed the Shared Education Programme at Queen's University as well, which are doing exceptional work in relation to this area. Uh, the Minister in his statement has said that we do not want an education system blighted, bl blighted by separation, 
and the First Minister has said it's fundamentally wrong that our education system separates our children at such, on the basis of religion at such a young age. Can I ask the Minister how he will reassure people who say that these proposals fall far short of the fundamental change needed to address this separation? Um, t time and time again in this society, we have, it has been proven that you need to encourage and facilitate communities to move forward. And I accept that often communities are ahead of the politicians. Right? So I think what this shared education report does, it allows for encouragement and facilitating communities to move forward and also challenges communities and politicians to move forward at a pace which has not been seen in the past. Uh, I, I want to see an education system going forward in the future where we're not separated by religion, ethnicity, or socioeconomic background. We have not achieved that yet, but I believe this shared education report, my responses to the shared education report, allow us to move forward at a pace which will achieve that goal in the short to medium term. And that's what we need to be. We need to be focused on that. We may argue over the last three recommendations within the report, but there are 17 other recommendations there which I believe have general support uh, in the Assembly and they need to be driven forward. Uh, OFM, DFM are backing up their calls with uh, finances. They're, they're supporting us in our discussions with Atlantic philanthropies. Moving forward, excuse me, I've been on my feet too long. And they are encouraging all ministers to play their part in building a united community. This is one of the building blocks in building a united community. Order members, that includes questions on the minister's statement. Members, order. members will know that points of order are not taken, not taken during uh, minister's statements. But I will take Mr. Anderson's point of order now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, during the Minister's reply to my colleague Stephen Moutley, he made a number of references to, to, uh, to uh, funding, or whatever it was, uh, to my party. I, I would take it. But is it in order, Mr. Speaker? Can I ask you for the Minister to make continuous uh, references to supporters of parties in this chamber or otherwise when a member asks a legitimate question and expects? a responsible answer, but to continually cast across this chamber about supporters and personal attitudes. I, 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 that needs to be looked at. Order, 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 order. This is a debating chamber. It's an exchange of views, but the member has, has it now on the record, and I think that's important more than anything else. Order. Is it a further point of order to Mr Anderson's point of order? In answer to the question that I raised with the Minister, he indicated that I was interested in only two schools in my constituency. I want to refute that. I work for every school in my community. And the Minister might be embarrassed with the situation that he's got himself uh, in the maintained sector, but he's not going to destroy the control sector in my constituency. Order once again. Order. Order once again. The member has it on the record. Point of order. Mr Moudry has said that he refutes the allegation that the Minister makes, but can I ask you to review Hansard to see what Mr Moudry actually said, because I think you will find that it is uh, on parliamentary language. Order, order, order. <laughs> you know, I continue to read Hansard, uh, you know, but, but let us move on. Let us move on. Order. 